They say real developers like curves, and personally, I love myself a curvaceous website, where each content section transitions elegantly with some waves, blobs, or ripples. In today's beginner-friendly tutorial, you'll learn how to turn your flat, boring design into a beautiful curvy one that will turn people's heads. We'll start with a basic HTML homepage that has a hero at the top, a few content sections, and a footer at the bottom. Then you'll learn a variety of techniques to add curves to these elements, like CSS border radius, SVG backgrounds, and we'll even make some animated morphing blobs with JavaScript. That may seem complicated, but it's actually much easier than it looks because there's some amazing tools out there that can make our lives much easier that you've probably never heard of. And I'll show you a bunch of cool productivity and CSS tips along the way. If you're new here, like and subscribe, and follow along with the full written tutorial on Fireship.io. To get started with this project, all you need to do is open up an editor like VS Code and create a plain HTML file. Inside that file, type an exclamation point followed by tab to generate some initial HTML boilerplate. That's called an Emmet snippet and it's built into VS Code and we can actually use it to generate a bunch of sections of content as well. In this demo, we have eight sections of content, so we'll type section times eight, then a right angle bracket to add a child to that element, which in this case will be an H1 with the text of nice curves. Notice how I have it wrapped in parentheses because after that I have a plus sign to add a child next to the H1, which itself will be a paragraph with some dummy text inside of it. Now go ahead and hit tab and Emmet will automatically generate all of that HTML for you. And now that we have a basic HTML page, let's go ahead and serve it in the browser. Here's a little trick to gracefully serve your app locally. Open up the command line and if you have Node.js installed on your machine, you can run npx serve. That'll link you to localhost 5000 where you should now be able to see the website. And if you don't have Node.js installed, you can just copy the path to the HTML file and paste it into your browser. Currently, the website looks terrible. So let's go to Google Fonts to improve it with a custom font. Select any font you want, and it will provide an HTML snippet that can be pasted into the head of the document. Then right below that, I'm opening up a style tag where we'll define all of the CSS styles for this project. Let's start by targeting the body of the content and setting its margin to zero. Then we'll define our font family as the one we selected from Google Fonts. The text color will be light, and the background will be something dark. From there we can target the section element, which represents a block of content in the web page. You'll notice I'm setting the position to relative. This won't change the appearance of it, but it allows its children to be absolutely positioned within it, which is something that will come into play later as we position our backgrounds. Then after that, we can use CSS Flexbox to make it a flexible container, allowing us to easily center the content in each section. Here's a little side tip. When working with Flexbox in the browser, right click and choose inspect element. That'll bring up the browser dev tools and you'll notice buttons here that you can click to change the actual properties on Flexbox without having to memorize all the different properties available in CSS. Then after that, we can give each section a minimum height of 400 pixels. And for padding, I'll add a hundred pixels to the top and bottom. And for the left and right, I'll use a flexible unit called view width that will give me 20% of the actual viewport width. And that'll just make the design a little more responsive to different screen sizes. Our design is already looking a lot better, but now let's go ahead and add a few utility classes to distinguish between different colors. We can add this class to any section to set the background to that color. Now we're ready to implement our first curve. And to do that, I'm going to add an empty div below the content with a class of curve. Normally it's not a good practice to have empty divs lying around, but you could add content inside of here if you want it to sit on top of the curve itself. Now this curve will be implemented with plain CSS, but I have to warn you that this is the most difficult example in this entire video. Don't get discouraged if it seems too complicated because the upcoming examples are way easier Easier to implement. I'm demonstrating this example primarily to show you that it is possible to implement fairly complex curves with nothing but CSS. The curve itself will have a position of absolute and be placed at the bottom of its parent div. Remember we set the parent section element to position relative, which is important here because it places the curve inside of the section as opposed to the main body of the page. That gives us an empty div to work with. Now we can target the before and after pseudo elements which are basically like invisible HTML elements that we can target with our CSS. And in this example, you can think of each one as a circle that we will intersect together to create the illusion of a curve. The content of the element will be an empty string, then it will have a position of absolute. Then the interesting thing is that it has a border radius with two values. If it was just one value, it would create a perfect circle, but when you add a second value, it creates an ellipse where the first argument represents the vertical radius and the second, the horizontal radius. Then after that, we'll set its width and height. Now at this point, we can apply the exact same styles to the after element as well. 
That'll give us two circles to work with, and now the tricky part is getting them to line up properly to look like a curve. The first one will be our dark circle, and the after element is the blue circle. The tricky part is putting the circles in the proper location, which will likely take a lot of trial and error. I'm using the transform property along with translate, which is just a fancy way to say move the circle to a different location. The arguments to translate represent the x and y axis. The final thing I'll do is on the after element add z index negative 1, which ensures the darker element will sit on top of the lighter one. Let's go ahead and open up the page in the browser, and the curve should now be visible. If you look closely, you may notice that it's not exactly perfect. What you'll likely need to do is open up the browser dev tools and play with the values to move them around until they get perfectly aligned. Now, another issue is that the current implementation is causing the content to overflow horizontally. That's not good, but an easy way to fix the problem is to set the overflow X property to hidden on the parent element. That gets the job done, but I think CSS is more well suited for curves that have a single ellipse or circle. Let's go back down to the HTML and add a class of bubble to one section and a class of dark to another section. We can easily add a curve here by only targeting the after pseudo element and giving it an elliptical border radius on the top left and top right, followed by absolute positioning to put it in the appropriate location. This example is very similar to the last one in many ways, but far more simple. I would definitely use CSS for something like that, but for more complex curves, let's take a look at how scalable vector graphics, or SVG, can simplify our lives. First, let's go into our HTML and add a class of red to one of the sections. The cool thing about SVG is that we can use a design tool or a purpose-built web app like this one called Shape Divider to automatically draw the SVG and provide the required CSS to add it to the UI instantly. Experiment with different settings to get the design you're going for, then click the download button and copy the HTML snippet. It contains an SVG graphic that we can simply paste into the bottom of one of our sections. It has a div with an automatically generated class name, which I'm going to change to wave just to simplify things here. From there, we can go back to the tool and copy the CSS code. Paste that inside the style tags, then highlight the class name, then right click to change all the occurrences to the wave class. Now if we go back to the browser, we have a wave that looks better than the first one with far less effort. But now let's take things to the next level by using yet another free tool called HiK. This web app has a really beautiful UI and is dedicated to generating SVG backgrounds automatically. I'm going to use the layered waves option and put the waves on the top. You can tweak things here to look however you want. The only important thing here is that you select colors that go with the colors in your actual CSS code. The other thing I'm going to do here is change the aspect ratio. You can almost think of this graphic as like a fancy border or separator between content sections, so it needs to be long and skinny. Make a note of that aspect ratio because we're going to need it later. After you're happy with the appearance, go ahead and click the button to download the file as an SVG into your project. From there, let's go into the CSS and create a class called Spacer. We'll use a relatively new CSS feature called Aspect Ratio. Instead of trying to manage the width and height of the element, we can use the aspect ratio property and set it to whatever value we used for the aspect ratio on the image. Then we'll use the image as a background on whatever element has this class. The image should take up the entire element, so we'll set background repeat to no repeat, position it in the center, and give it a background size of cover. Then we may want to use this class multiple times, so I'm creating a second class that defines the background image as the SVG graphic that we just downloaded. From there, we can go down to the HTML and add an empty div with these two classes in order to apply that image as the transition between two sections. Now again, using an empty div like this is sometimes considered a bad practice, but I do think it's acceptable in this case, and it's definitely the easiest way to get the job done. The end result is this really cool looking section. With just a couple of SVG graphics and some CSS, we can really make this design stand out. But we're not done yet. For the grand finale, we're going to bring in JavaScript to create an animated morphine SVG to really make the web page come to life. In the HTML, I'm adding a class of pink and then adding those spacer layers on either side of it. And the top one has a class of flip because we need that one to do a 180. The flip class in the CSS is just a utility that will rotate the element by 180 degrees. It should look something like this, but now let's add a rotating blob right in the middle. To generate the blob, I'll go back to the HiK app and create two random graphics with the blob shape. I've downloaded them into the project, but what I actually need is the source code from the raw SVG file. I'm taking the code from one of the blobs and pasting it down inside of the section. What you want to do next is right click and hit format document so we can see all the properties on it clearly. Inside the SVG code, you'll notice a rect or rectangle element go ahead and delete that one. What we're interested in is the path, which is the shape of the blob itself. 
that gives us one blob in the SVG, but we actually want a second blob in there as well. So we're going to go into our other blob and find the G element, which means group, and go ahead and copy that element from the raw SVG code. Once copied, go back to the SVG in the HTML and paste it as the sibling to the other group. I realized that was very cumbersome and it would be a lot easier if you used a design tool like Figma, but that's beyond the scope of this video. At this point, you should see two blobs on top of each other. Now, in order to animate one blob into the other, we need to give each path an ID, which we'll call blob one and blob two. Now, normally a morph animation is pretty difficult to pull off, but I discovered this library called Qt.js or maybe Qt.js, not sure how to pronounce it. It feels kind of similar to Greensock if you've ever used an animation library like that. And to install it, all we have to do is add the script tag for the CDN link to the head of the document. Then down at the bottom of the section, we'll add a script that references the global object Qt with a K and its from to method. It'll use blob1 as the starting SVG and then animate to the blob2 SVG. And as a final argument, we can add an object with some options on it, like the duration, which will be 3000 milliseconds, and also the yo-yo option, which will have it go back and forth between the two animation states. And lastly, call animation start, and that's all it takes to create an SVG morphing animation with JavaScript. Just a couple of other little points here. We need to make the second blob have a visibility of hidden so it's not visible when the animation first starts. And then I'm also going to add some basic positioning CSS here to position the blob directly underneath the main content in that section. The end result is this beautiful curvaceous website. I'm gonna go ahead and wrap things up there, but if you like content like this, upgrade to a pro membership on Fireship.io to get access to all of my premium videos. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one.